Hello everyone, Cobalt the 16th here today to answer the question of whether or not Neanderthals would be qualified to receive human rights. With advances in genomics accelerating faster than ever before, the day when humanity will be able to successfully replicate extinct species is getting ever nearer. One such extinct species that could be revived is Homo neanderthalensis, more commonly known just by the name Neanderthal. As is shown by the difference in binomial nomenclature, Neanderthals are not the same species as modern-day humans, Homo sapien. They are our closest relative within the Tree of Life. This made me wonder, if Neanderthals are not technically humans, would the specimens brought back from extinction be granted human rights? This very topic is what will be explored today, but before we begin delving into today's topic, I would like to state that all of the content within this video is based upon presumptions made from reputable sources of information, but by no means is the answer to this question a solid yes or no. With that said, let's get into today's video. In order to know whether or not Neanderthals would be granted human rights, we must first define human rights. According to the United Nations, human rights are rights inherent to all human beings regardless of race, sex, nationality, ethnicity, language, religion, or any other status. Based upon the definition alone, we can tell that Neanderthals would not receive human rights by the current definition because they are not technically human beings, but this does not mean that the definition could not be edited. This begs the question, would the definition of human rights be changed if Neanderthals were brought back from extinction? What qualities or capabilities would Neanderthals need to possess in order to be protected under human rights? It is likely that they would need to show qualities and traits that we consider inherently human. Such qualities and traits could include sentience, emotion, capability for complex language, and artistic expression in forms such as physical art and music. Combine all of these separate aspects together and you can have a culture protected by human rights. The only question is whether or not Neanderthals possess any or all of them. The first qualities that I will address are sentience and emotion. According to Eleanor Boyle, sentience has both broad and narrow definitions, but may be applied to species which philosopher Tom Reagan calls subjects of a life, aware of what happens to them and that events affect their lives. Boyle continues on this subject by stating, one working definition is that sentient creatures are those who have feelings, both physical and emotional, and whose feelings matter to them. Many animal species have been shown to have the capacity for emotions. Humpback whales have been found to possess cortical spindle cells that are used for emotional processing, and macaque monkeys have within their nervous systems mirror neurons used for empathetic behavior and learning. Although neither of these species is a perfect analog for Neanderthals, it is not ridiculous to assume that the closest relative of human beings would possess superior emotional capability to both humpback whales and macaques. In addition, many mammal species that are commonly used in pharmaceutical studies have human-like molecular brain receptors that respond to the same neurotransmitters as human beings. Some of these neurotransmitters are responsible for emotional responses, such as dopamine's connection to pleasure. This evidence leads me to believe that Neanderthals were likely to have had sentience and emotion similar to that of humans. The second qualification that I will be discussing is the capability for complex language. Interaction through language infers that you have both the capability to speak the language yourself, but also to listen and understand when somebody else responds. If Neanderthals were incapable of either skill, they would not be able to communicate effectively. Language has been thought of as a fairly recent development that was exclusive to anatomically modern humans, but evidence exists that could set the beginning of language back to 500,000 years ago. According to Dan Dedu and Stefan Levinson, recognizably modern language is likely an ancient feature of our genus predating at least the common ancestor of modern humans and Neanderthals about half a million years ago. One key piece of evidence supporting the hypothesis that Neanderthals were capable of developing language is the presence of an almost identical FOXP2 gene to that of humans. The FOXP2 gene is linked to the development and use of language. Neanderthals and humans have an identical copy of the gene other than a small difference in the eighth intron. It seems that the Neanderthal copy of the gene is functional though because it is still present in the genomes of some modern day humans. Whether or not the Neanderthal's larynx and hyoid bone positioning was optimal for modern speech is not certain. 
Did you and Levinson believe that the structure and position of such components would have allowed for speech, but there has been fairly extensive work showing that the position of the hyoid bone in a Neanderthal's vocal tract cannot be safely assumed from other skeletal features. While there is uncertainty in the Neanderthal's capability to speak due to the position of the hyoid bone, their ability to receive information from modern speech is much more certain. Human audiograms, which quantify the range of hearing, show that humans are more sensitive to sound between 1 and 6 kHz, especially between 2 and 4 kHz when compared to other primates. From Neanderthal ossicles, Quam and Rock determined that the auditory range of Neanderthals were essentially identical to that of modern humans, which supports the hypothesis that Neanderthals would have vocalized within the same range that modern humans speak. The third and final subject that I inquired about was the artistic expression of Neanderthals. Although there are many ways to artistically express oneself, I decided to focus on two physical artifacts, one of which is a prelude to a second form of art. The first artifact, which is currently on your screen, was found in France by Jean-Claude Marquet and Michel Laure Blanchet. It was located in an area that was a known homeland of Neanderthals. According to Marquet and Laure Blanchet, the flint nodule and bone fragment were meant to look like the face of an animal or a Neanderthal. The bone splinter was forcefully pushed into the flint's conduit and tightly secured, then the flint was retouched to create symmetry. All of this evidence together is a compelling argument that whoever inserted the shard of bone into the flint was intentionally expressing themselves artistically. The second artifact of artistic importance is a flute carved from bone. In the article, The Music of Nature and the Nature of Music, a 53,000-year-old Neanderthal flute carved from a bear's bone was located in Slovenia. The type of flute is not completely clear, but it is believed to be a recorder-type flute. The article states, It appears that our Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal ancestors were as fond of music as we are. The evidence of artistic expression through music compounded with the flint and bone fragment face shows that Neanderthals had developed the beginnings of an artistic culture before they became extinct. It looks as if Neanderthals would likely meet all of the criteria that I have laid down as a foundation for acquiring human rights, but some would still argue against this reasoning. As I stated before, there is no concrete yes or no answer to whether or not Neanderthals would be granted human rights. But in my opinion, I believe that if they were brought back from extinction, and all of the criteria were met, Neanderthals would be granted human rights. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe if you have not already done so. And if you have a topic that you would like me to investigate and discuss in a future video, please leave a comment in the comments section of this video. This is Cobalt the 16th signing out, and I will see you in the next video.